Thanks for listening. This is Brian Hurley from Business Performance Improvement. The podcast, Lean Six Sigma Bursts, are short lessons, comments, Q&A, and insights. If you have a question, send your question through the Anchor app, and we might feature you on a future episode. Or contact me at biz-pi.com. When I teach a Lean or Six Sigma class, I usually have some people in the class who I would call natural problem solvers, or they tell me that they are. And they'll say things like, I, well, I didn't know they had a name to this. I've been doing this type of work, you know, my whole career or my whole job. So that's great. And I think there is this kind of natural problem solving that we all have. So some of the aspects I think that they really resonate with is the idea of team building and bringing people together to talk about a problem from different areas and different perspectives. Another one is really about trying to understand the process whether it's a process mapping exercise or to observe or look at the process or talk to people in the process. I think that's pretty intuitive for a lot of people. So that's not really new for someone, but maybe the Gemba walk is a new term for them or the value stream map is a new way, a new way of mapping the process. I think collecting data is pretty intuitive for a lot of people. Maybe the type of data they're collecting isn't quite as clear as what they might come up with after a Six Sigma class, or maybe the amount of samples or how to display the data, that might be new to them. I think brainstorming is pretty common, you know, just bouncing ideas off each other, trying to come up with good ideas. So I think that's pretty the, the intuitive part of most people's problem solving skills. I think where it gets a little non-intuitive is when we get into the data analysis methods, when we start breaking down the data and looking at it Um, slicing and dicing it, looking at certain types of charts they might not have thought about before. When we get into the statistics, obviously, unless they have a statistics background and they've used it in a real life setting, um, that's probably new for them. So the hypothesis tests and ANOVA and regression, those tools are pretty new. I think defining the problem is also something that people don't naturally do a great, great job of. So we spend a lot of time in class talking about how to really define the problem clearly. What is the gap that you're trying to close? And do you really understand the problem? And I think people like to rush through that exercise. And I always reiterate that you need to take time and make sure everyone's on the same page of what the problem is. Because if you get that wrong, the rest of your improvement is going to be hard to measure. And it's going to be hard to tell if you're even on the right track which leads into the measurement assessment or the quality of the data. I think there's intuitiveness around that the data may not always be good, but how people can assess that properly, I think that's missing skill. So the gauge R&R study I think is really eye-opening for people. I know personally that's the tool that really caught me off guard was the fact that you can study how good the data is and how often I found in my experience that it's been bad or misleading. The concept of batching versus one piece flow is very unintuitive for most people. It's usually pretty eye-opening for people when they see the difference because it does not make sense. And I think it's true that there's a natural inclination for us to batch. So it's kind of, we're fighting our own natural behaviors on that. So that one usually gets a really good response. And then just some of the more advanced tools with like design of experiments, um, control charts, multi-factor regression. I think those tools are obviously new for people and those who are really good at math and data really like those. But I think even other tools, I I would call like value stream mapping as a little bit more advanced. Usually I don't start off with that right away. We'll do like a process map of some sort. But eventually we'll get to the point where it's looking more like, you know, the standard textbook version of a value stream map. And that takes a little bit of time to be able to collect the data to know the cycle times and the lead times and the inventory levels at each of those paces. So for individuals who are natural problem solvers, I think they find part of the training to be intuitive and logical, and they just didn't know it had a name to some of the techniques or concepts. And then I think the other part of the training for them is, you know, new things that they hadn't learned or maybe are counterintuitive to what they've learned before. So if you've done any training, I wonder if that's your same experience as mine, or if you've seen some um, other experience. Thanks for your time. LeanSixSigmaDefinition.com 
has a list of glossary items about popular process improvement terms, along with a history of Lean and Six Sigma methods, and key influencers like Dr. Edward Stemming, Henry Ford, Taichi Ono, Shigeo Shingo, and many more. You can also learn how to access affordable Lean and Six Sigma training and certification. Visit LeanSixSigmaDefinition.com.